Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. Thanks for tuning in, and it's my pleasure to be here. And now I am ready to resume our reading and discussion of the book, The Papacy and the Civil Power, by R.W. Excuse me, by R. W. Thompson. And near the end of the broadcast last night, we were talking, uh, last time, we were talking about the Jesuit order and the papacy, particularly Pope Pius IX, at the time of the, the encyclical and syllabus of error of 1864, which damned our Protestant constitution and form of government and all popular governments, and the declaration of papal infallibility at the First Vatican Council in 1870, and that since the groundwork had been laid and the deified status of the Pope had been accepted, particularly among Roman Catholics in the United States of America, where Catholicism is freely practiced, even during the time of this European overthrow of papal authority, the Pope is trying to assert his divine right rule over the entire world, and the Jesuits are his faithful and powerful rowers, rowing the bark of Peter to world supremacy, King of kings and Lord of lords. And at this time, the author wishes to do what I am somewhat criticized for not doing enough of, and that is to make a distinction between the papacy and the average laity of the Roman Catholic Church. So I will let R.W. Thompson make that distinction as eloquently as he does in deference to my critics. Now, remember the Pope is overthrowing or exciting the Roman Catholics of the world to overthrow their popular governments and to reestablish papal authority in the world. No, nowhere else in the world was that cry heard than in the United States of America. Catholics were ready to go to bat for their pope. And during this period of time, it says, while a sign, uh, by the way, and if you're following along in the book, I'm beginning in the last paragraph on page 112, talking about reasserting the papacy as king of kings and lord of lords, having been stripped of his temporal authority, it was now time to replace the pope, uh, put the pope back on his, uh, his throne. In other words, to heal that mortal wound, as the Bible describes it. And it says, while assigning these purposes to the Pope and his hierarchs, however, we should not fail to keep in mind the distinction between Roman Catholicism as a system of religion and the papacy as an all-absorbing religious political power founded upon human ambition. Nor should we forget that distinction which exists in a great extent, especially in the United States, between intelligent Roman Catholic laymen and the priesthood. There are thousands of these laymen who do not and cannot, in their consciences, approve of all that is done and said in behalf of papal supremacy in this country in any other sense than as they suppose it to involve the mere triumph of their religious beliefs over all opposing forms of faith. They believe Protestantism to be error and all its forms of religion to be false, and yet, in return for its tolerance to them, would be perfectly willing to extend like tolerance to it, even where they had the power to withhold it. But these men, good and faithful citizens in all respects, suffer themselves to occupy a false position by allowing their acquiescence in that to which their judgment does not assent, to be inferred from the silence which the papacy imposes upon them. But the priesthood, now here's the distinction, but the priesthood, especially the Jesuit part of them, 
compose an entirely distinct and different class. They are educated, instructed, drilled, and set apart for the special work in which they are engaged with no other thoughts to occupy their minds and no other earthly objects to accomplish. They are the servants of the papacy in the same sense in which a slave is the servant to his master and are indebted to the Pope for all the enormous power they employ. They swear obedience and submission to the Pope as the infallible vicar of Christ and perfectly well understand that if they failed to render this obedience and submission to the full extent demanded by the Pope, their official robes would be instantaneously stripped off. They are simply a band of ecclesiastical office holders held together by the cohesive power of a common ambition as compactly as an army of soldiers and are governed by a commander-in-chief whose brow they would adorn forever with a kingly crown and who wields the papal lash over them with imperial threatenings. All these, with exception, if any, too few to be observed, are laboring with wonderful assiduity to educate the whole membership of their church, the Roman Catholic Church, up to the point of accepting without hesitation or inquiry all the Jesuit teachings in reference to the papacy as a necessary and indispensable part of their religious faith. Now listen to this. So that whensoever the papal order shall be issued, they may march their columns unbroken into the papal army. R.W. Thompson has just laid down the end game for the papacy to propound his divine right status, to propound his kingly status, to propound his infallible status, and to command a papal army. He's getting his officers, his priests, particularly his Jesuits, and the Roman Catholic laity in this country to recognize him as the supreme being on earth, the representative of Christ, because he's about ready to go to war as their commander. And they are going to march in single file, united in mind for one purpose and one purpose only, to finally establish, or rather reestablish, the papal scepter over the entire world. Now, these, speaking of the Roman Catholic hierarchy, the priests, particularly the Jesuits, these are they who write books, pamphlets, and tracts and fill the columns of our newspapers with fulsome and blasphemous adulation for the Pope, applying to him terms that are due only to God all devoted to the object of exterminating Protestantism, civil and religious. Here's another acknowledgment. Not only is Protestantism a religion, a Bible-based religion, the Christian religion, but it also has a civil aspect. Free government, popular government, government of, by, and for the people. If the people are knowledgeable in the Scriptures and are filled with the Holy Spirit of God, they have God's law within them. They do not need a hierarchical government like the Roman Catholics do. And R.W. Thompson acknowledges that here. He said, all devoted to the object of exterminating Protestantism, civil and religious, that is, destroying the, the Protestant religion and destroying the Protestant governments and extending the scepter of, pap of the papacy over the world. Do you realize R.W. Thompson has just described the New World Order and that the New World Order is simply the Old World Order restored? And he says, they manufacture to order the literature 
of Romanism and tax their ingenuity to the utmost to make it, in all its various uh, variations, center in these grand designs. Total papal supremacy in the world. That's the grand design of the papacy. And now I want to take the opportunity to recommend a book entitled The Grand Design Exposed by John Daniel. Get a copy of The Grand Design Exposed by John Daniel, and he will detail how this grand design, this new world order, the establishment of the papacy as a sovereign king of the entire world in his book. Very, very important book, and we'll get to it eventually here on Inquisition Update. We thank John Daniel for being a one-time guest of this program, and we thank him for his book, and we'll read it here on Inquisition Update. Now, the author continues, he says, Examples are innumerable, and almost any one of them selected from the multitude is an index to the remainder. In other words, there's a method for every publication, pamphlet, newspaper article that comes out written by the Jesuit order. That's to prepare the Roman Catholic Church for the confrontation that they expect or that they will precipitate to take place between Roman Catholicism and Protestantism. Roman Catholicism cannot flourish cannot achieve its grand design so long as Protestantism, true Bible Protestantism, exists in the world. There cannot be any more protest against the divine right vicar of Christ on earth, the papacy. For that, for the Pope to be seated finally on his self-arrogated throne... Protestantism must be destroyed. Now, he continues, in 1862, a Jesuit priest by the name of Reverend F.X. Weniger made what he chose to designate, quote, an appeal to candid Americans on the subject of Protestantism and infidelity, which is the offensive title to his book. He represented himself as having been engaged for 13 years as a Catholic missionary throughout the United States and consequently as having had extraordinary opportunities of observing the character and habits of our Protestant population as well as having been, become familiar with the workings of our Protestant institutions. These facts were stated, of course, to give weight and authority to his opinions. For while he professed to be addressing Protestants, but few of them would ever see his book, he was true with the true Jesuit he was with the true Jesuit cunning really addressing the members of his own Roman Catholic Church with the design of convincing them that Protestantism is already a failure, so as to stimulate them to renewed activity in their exertions to repress and exterminate it. He scarcely enters upon his subject before announcing that, quote, Protestantism is ending in the desolation of heathenism, unquote. That is, that we in this country are fast becoming paganized as the result of our total want of religion or any religious convictions. Then, in contrast to this alarming condition into which we have been plunged by our infidelity, he points us to Roman Catholicism as furnishing the only means of making us acquainted personally with Jesus Christ. He says, quote, The real presence of Jesus Christ. Now, here we're talking about the transubstantiation, the Mass. We're talking about the Holy Eucharist the piece of bread that is worshipped in the Roman Catholic Church. They are all taught that this piece of bread that they partake of in the Mass is not bread. That when it's blessed by the priest, it becomes the literal blood, body, soul, and divinity of Christ. It is Jesus Christ and should be worshipped as Christ. 
Now, they call that the real presence, that Jesus is really present in the bread of communion in the Roman Catholic Church. He says the real presence of Jesus Christ, in other words, the Eucharist, makes a heaven of every Catholic Church on the whole earth, unquote. So what's the first point that this Jesuit makes? To be a true Christian, you must partake in the Eucharist. And you will find that this is the driving force behind the ecumenical movement today, to unite all Christians, Catholic and evangelical, to a common communion. Okay? The object of Catholicism is to get us all to partake of this blasphemy, this idolatry, this abomination, and call it Jesus, and worship it together with Roman Catholics. That's the driving force behind the ecumenical movement today. Now, you're going you're gonna to start seeing Protestant churches, Baptist churches, evangelical churches, all talking about the real presence of Christ in the communion bread. This is Roman Catholicism. This is paganism. This was practiced in ancient Egypt and all the way back to Babylon. And that's what characterizes the Roman Catholic Church as mystery Babylon. And it's a mystery. It should be a mystery to any God-fearing, Bible-believing person how anyone who calls himself evangelical or Protestant would even consider that that bread taken at communion is literally Jesus. But that's what Rome insists. That's the very basis for their religion. And to conquer Protestantism, they must accept this abomination called the real presence now, again, he says, the real presence of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist, I will add, makes a, hev makes a heaven of every Roman Catholic church in the whole earth. For there he can be conversed with face to face every day and every hour. That's right. Only the Roman Catholic church, according to this Jesuit priest, has Jesus every day and every hour in their churches to be confronted face to face with his believers. They walk into the church, they genuflect, they cross themselves, sprinkle themselves with holy water, walk to the front of the church, pick a pew and sit down, and gaze and stare lovingly into of the face of a piece of bread. That's their worship. Now, I emphasize this because I spent most of my life as a Protestant, as an attendee of Pentecostal and Baptist churches, never understanding a thing about Roman Catholicism. Never knew a thing about it. It was never taught. Sure, we studied the Scriptures, and that is all important. But never did I understand what the differences are between Protestantism and the Roman Catholic Church, and it's important for God's people to know. Now, he continues, this Jesuit priest blasphemously insists that in Holy Communion, Jesus enters our interior, really and substantially, body and soul. Again, he is re-emphasis that this Jesus that they eat enters them. That's how grace enters the body. It's not imputed by God, as it says in the Scriptures. To the Roman Catholic, it is infused. The participant in the Mass receives grace when he eats Jesus. I mean, this is pure paganism. And here this Jesuit priest is accusing Protestantism of paganism. R.W. Thompson is wise enough to show us the hypocrisy, the rank hypocrisy and idolatry of Catholicism in defense of Protestantism. And the, the, the Jesuit 
uh, author continues, and that Protestantism, having robbed us of all this consolation, in other words, done away with the Mass as an abomination of abominations, has deprived Roman Catholicism of all the consolation that they once held for the Mass. In other words, Protestantism has made a laughing stock of Catholicism, has shown the folly of this paganism, and has robbed Roman Catholics of the consolation, the comfort, the blessings of this so-called Jesus cookie, because they've rejected it. Now, to the Roman Catholics, if you reject the Mass, you've rejected Christ. You no longer have Jesus within you. Only the Roman Catholic Church has Jesus within them. And that Protestantism has rejected this Holy Eucharist. They have rejected Christ. They are infidels. And they are dangerous to the Roman Catholic Church. And for the Roman Catholic Church to survive, it must destroy this Protestant heresy. I'm telling you, they believe when they kill a Protestant, they do God's service. And this defines all of history, all the bloody wars and crusades, the vigor with which the Roman Catholic populations of Europe went to war to defend their idolatry, their Eucharist, their Jesus. Again, this Jesuit priest is condemning Protestantism as having robbed the Roman Catholics of the consolation that they received from the Holy Eucharist and says he'd been better left off. It, they're no better off than infidels and Jews. Now, we all know what the Roman Catholic Church believes uh, about infidels and Jews and that Protestantism has reduced the Catholics to nothing more than infidels and Jews. Do you see the hatred that this Roman Catholic priest, this Jesuit priest, is instilling into the hearts and minds of Roman Catholics around the world, particularly in the United States, against Protestants, and particularly against their Protestant government? And he's doing it by emphasizing the importance of the Mass, the Eucharist, and the infallibility of the Pope as the vicar of Christ. And he continues, he says, Hence he found no difficulty in concluding that, quote, the only consolation Protestantism as such has to offer is a wicked one. Sin, but believe. Unquote. To him, Protestantism is wrapped up in this. Sin, but believe. All you have to do is believe. You don't have to take the Jesus cookie. You don't have to, conf to confess your sins to a pedophile priest. You don't have to go to Mass. You don't have to worship the angels and the saints and all the rigmarole, the Babylonian rigmarole of the Roman Catholic Church. You don't have to bow and worship and give your total assent to the Pope the vicar of Christ, you simply believe. But that's what the Bible says. Believe, and thou shalt be saved. Turn from sin, but believe. If you sin, you have an advocate with the Father. If you believe, if you do not believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. And on and on and on it goes. Roman Catholicism is a works religion, and they use that to attack Protestantism. This Jesuit priest, after assailing Protestantism as paganism, and characterizes Protestantism in three words, sin but believe, the author now really makes a tremendous point. R.W. Thompson is a genius writer. He says this Jesuit priest's over-anxiousness to assail Protestantism rendered him oblivious to the fact that his own church 
and the order to which he belongs, that is, the Jesuit order, both teach that popes and priests may sin and yet remain infallible representatives of God and may be guilty of all the impurities of life and yet administer infallibly all the sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church. So we have a Jesuit priest condemning Protestantism in three words, sin, but believe. And R.W. Thompson proves that that's exactly what the Roman Catholic hierarchy do. They sin and then call themselves infallible, and then, through that infallibleness, declare themselves the, the, the unique divine right rulers of the earth. And if you were a regular listener to the Inquisition Update and heard us read the book by Peter de Rosa, a Jesuit priest himself, called The Dark Side of the Papacy, Vickers of Christ, The Dark Side of the Papacy, you're now aware of some of the diabolical history of the popes throughout the ages. R.W. Thompson well knows his subject. And he points out once again that while out of one side of their mouths they condemn Protestantism as easy believism, salvation by belief, they turn right around and sin and then call themselves infallible. Now, continuing, he says, as if he were an oracle whose opinions were not to be questioned, he says, quote, Protestantism leads to despair because it denies free will. Now, many Protestants would stand up right now, I'm just going to interject, that no, we acknowledge free will. We choose Christ, right? That's what's being taught in most Protestant churches or many Protestant churches. But the early Protestants read their Bibles, and they understood that it was God who chooses. Now, I am often accused of being an Arminian, a free will guy. That's because I make a more mature understanding of the Scriptures these days than do my critics. I understand that as an early Christian, yes, I, like everyone else, went to the altar because I chose Christ. I had free will. But as I became a man and put away childish things and became more understanding in the Scriptures, I realized that what I once thought was my free will was literally the divine providence of God. It was He who chose me. And I recognized from the Scriptures that there's not one thing in a fallen man that would make him desire Christ. The human heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? No man seeketh after God. That's the true condition of man. And that I came to repentance was a divine work. It was not an act of my own free will. Though I mistakenly believed that I was in charge of my own salvation early in my Christian life, that I continued in the gospel, continued in the scriptures, I realized the truth. I was giving myself far too much credit. It was God who chose me. The Father chooses the bride for his son. Okay? That's the belief of the Protestant Reformers. They were mature in the scriptures. They understood it was God who does the choosing. And while we as yet young Christians believe that our free will was a, a matter of this, that we accepted Christ and the gospel, we later discover that it was God's divine work all the time. Salvation is of the Lord, not of man. Free will is not taught in the gospel. Now, the Roman Catholic Church teaches free will. You come to the church, you freely partake of the Eucharist. You freely take of the, partake of the sacraments. 
you do it of your own free will. You are the master of your own salvation, so to speak, in the Roman Catholic Church. This is being taught in many of the apostate evangelical churches. And as the ecumenical movement marches onward and upwards, and more and more evangelical churches are conforming to the doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church to unite and to create a one-world Christian church, this free will becomes all the more important to conform them to the image of Antichrist. Now, the author continues that it is a religion of immorality, they say, of, Roman, of uh, Protestantism. That Protestantism first it leads to despair because it denies free will, that it is a religion of immorality, that it is a religion of disorder and despotism. <laughs> Amazing. The, the papacy calling Protestantism despotism. You know what makes Protestantism despotism in the mind of the Pope? You're despots. If you walk away from the divine right authority of the Pope and assert that same authority to yourself. See, that's what they see in Protestantism. That each and every one of us becomes our own Pope. Becomes our own priest. They fail to recognize that it is Christ that indwells that becomes our high priest. We are the body of Christ. We have his instruction and his, his, his spirit and his comfort and assurance within us. We don't need a pope anymore. Okay? They call that despotism. Amazing, isn't it? The hypocrisy of the Roman Catholic Church. And it says Protestantism is a religion of blasphemy. Huh. Who could claim Protestantism as blasphemous but the pope? Do you know why they call Protestants blasphemous? Because they, do, they deny the vicar of Christ. To them, that's equivalent as denying Christ himself, which is blasphemy. Or even worse, declaring that you are your own Christ, such as the Pope does with his very title, vicar of Christ. I am Christ. That's what it means. I am the replacement of Christ. Vicar means replacement. Hypocrisy, rank hypocrisy. That Protestantism came from licentiousness, apostate priests and monks, and from despotic licentious sovereigns. He's talking about the Protestant Reformation here, making direct reference to the apostate Roman Catholic priests and monks who protested the Roman Catholic cult, who protested the papacy, and bound themselves to Christ. He's speaking specifically about Martin Luther and all of them like him, the great reformers. They were the priests, licentious, apostate priests and monks of the Roman Catholic Church. And now he includes the despotic, licentious sovereigns, that is, the kings of Europe who were once Catholic and allowed the Pope to put their crowns upon their heads. They served at his behest. They now followed the Protestant reformers and no longer accepted their authority from the Pope, but from the people. To the papacy, these sovereigns, these kings that had rejected the power and the temporal power of the Pope and followed the Protestant reformers were despotic and licentious. And it says, the Protestant religion is dead. That it cherishes a reckless disposition to calumniate. In other words, Protestants recklessly defame the vicar of Christ, the Pope. To them, that's calumniation, false accusation, defamation and, to use their word, blasphemy. That modern civilization does not spring from Protestantism. That's right. The papacy believes that modernism comes from the advancements in Roman Catholicism, taking away the true 
the true credit from the advancements of the world of the Protestant Refor- re- that sprang out of the Protestant Reformation when the Pope could no longer hold the people down. Left to their own ingenuity, no longer subservient to the papacy, no longer serfs on the Pope's land, they now own their own property. They made money. They raised children. They sent them to college, taught them to read. They gave them Bibles to read. They were independent. They lived a life free in Christ, and the Pope was left sulking in the Vatican. And out of this freedom and liberty, ingenuity, education, literacy, came the civil, uh, the, uh, the modern civilization, industrialization. And the Pope says, no, that wasn't a result of the Protestant Reformation. That was because of Roman Catholicism. And all you have to do is look back in history is how, at how civilization had to live when the Pope ruled supreme. Squalor. Illiteracy. The people afraid when they rise up in the morning and fearful when they go to bed at night for fear of the Inquisition. No thought or will of their own. They were not allowed to read their Bibles. They had to accept the divine right authority of the Pope to make every decision in their lives moral and civil. Church and state were united. The people were suppressed. The gospel was suppressed. Only the Pope and his rich ruling elite, the kings of the earth, had any authority in the world. Only they had the right to be educated. Only they had the right to govern. The people could not govern. The people were to be governed. That's Roman Catholicism. He continues, and that infidelity is the last logical consequence of Protestantism. Infidelity to who? Infidelity to Christ in the Scriptures? Or infidelity to to the biblical and historical Antichrist, the Pope of Rome. You be the judge. R.W. Thompson has rightly judged and has set forth the very problems with Roman Catholicism and why it is so diametrically opposed to Protestantism. Why this Protestant form of government in the United States cannot live forever side by side with despotism, with popery, in peace and quiet. Before long, there will be a contest. And this Jesuit priest, Wenninger, that we're currently reading about, is declaring that conflict to be at hand. Now he says, all... The counts in this formidable indictment are so drawn as to display the skill and the ingenuity of a criminal prosecutor, of one who has had experience in all the formalities of arraignment. They were designed undoubtedly to stimulate the ardor of the papal followers in their efforts to remove all this irreligion out of the way, to remove Protestantism out of the way, and possibly to cause all timid-minded Protestants to shudder at the thought of the rapidity with which they were hastening to destruction. He rolled these terrible accusations like a sweet morsel under his tongue, and at every repetition of them sharpened the point of his pen that he might give them irresistible and convincing force. He made his real object, however, more apparent as he proceeded, and in the midst of an enumeration of Protestant prejudices, as he called them, which he felt it his duty to overcome, he expressed his pent-up feelings in these words. Listen to what he finally said. Quote, one of the most glorious enterprises of the Catholic Church to engage in at this day is the conversion of the United States to the Catholic faith, unquote. Bang! There you have it. The ultimate goal. This is the new world order. 
the conversion of the United States, yea, no, the world, to the Roman Catholic faith. To restore the old world order and call it new. There you, there you have it in a nutshell. A Jesuit priest just spilled his guts to convert all of America, and we know now the whole world, to the Catholic or the universal faith, the New World Order. Rome has had this design to rule the world since its very beginning. The New World Order shouldn't be new to anybody. We should have understood this a long time ago. But we just don't talk about these things in this country anymore. It, it, it's amazing that if this discussion lingers long in any purview, and particularly on amateur radio, the outrage that is, it, it, that is expressed against it. Oh, you're dividing the Christians at a time when the Muslims are so much powerful in the world and breeding like mice, and it is predicted demographically that they will rule the world in 50 years. We can't have people like Tom Fress dividing Christians. We have to unite against this common enemy. We have to unite with the Roman Catholic Church. We have to unite church and state in this country and declare a holy Roman crusade against the heretics of Islam. You see the bait and switch? Islam isn't the big problem. It's Roman Catholicism. And the momentum is going their way, and it is so frighteningly real. R.W. Thompson foresaw the overthrow of our democratic or republican form, our Protestant form of government, and the assertion of Roman Catholicism over the people. He says, now if the consummation of this object were sought for in the field of fair discussion without any dogmatic assumption of superiority on the part of either adversary, whether Catholic or Protestant, each remaining the equal of the other according to the spirit of our institutions, our Protestant institutions, all Protestant Christians would in true character hail Roman Catholicism as a desirable auxiliary in the work and the duty of evangelizing not merely the United States but the world. The Roman Catholic Church stripped of the influences of Jesuitism and brought back to its early purity would possess the capacity to perform a most glorious part in such an achievement. But no such liberal idea as this finds any place in the minds of this author or of any other Jesuit priest or of any of those who submit to their dictation. From such men, liberalism finds no quarter. They exhibit nothing higher or nobler than that supercilious air of imagined superiority which roots out every generous faculty of the mind and leaves its possessor an object of mangled pity and contempt. Thus impressed and fearing that he would fail in rallying the militia of the church to the support of the papacy if he did not speak plainly in defense of the sovereignty, the temporal sovereignty of the Pope over the whole world. This infatuated Jesuit thus declares, quote, in the ceremonies of the installation of a new pope, he is addressed with these words, Noveris et uh, te urbis et orbis const constitutum esse rectorum, which means, Remember that thou art placed on the throne of Peter as the ruler of Rome and the world. Unquote. Isn't it amazing that R.W. Thompson thinks that Roman Catholicism should return to its early purity? There was no early purity in Roman Catholicism. Even R.W. Thompson gives the Roman Catholic Church more credit than it deserves. It was conceived 
in sin. It was possessed of sin. It continues to be the antithesis of Christ and his body. And it was so from the very beginning. It is not the church that Paul established in Rome. It is the church that Simon Magus established in Rome. Simon the Sorcerer. But R.W. Thompson gives it credit, says it should return to its early purity, and that Christians, rather Protestants in this country, would gladly accept Roman Catholicism as an equal partner in evangelizing the world, and were it not for the despotism, some papacy, that unity could occur. Even in spite of revealing what he does in this book, it appears to me, at least at this stage of the reading of this book, that even R.W. Thompson considers Roman Catholicism Christianity in some form. I reject that. But nonetheless, he points out the blasphemy of the words that are uttered over the establishment of a new pope. He says, Remember, thou art placed on the throne of Peter as the ruler of Rome and the world. R. W. Thompson doesn't want us to miss the point that the papacy has always declaimed the divine right rule to, to uh, the divine right to rule the world, and he predicts in this book, in total, that he will, even the United States. And he says, in order, however, to make this Roman Catholic reader, uh, his Roman Catholic readers familiar with the manner in which the Pope would rule the world, when the power to do so was secured to him, he had a little while before addressed a threat of vengeance to the Protestants of the United States in order that they might experience a wholesome dread for their approaching doom in time to avoid it by penitence and submission. After defending the Roman Inquisition as a necessary part of ecclesiastical organization and coupling his reference to it with the Protestant complaint of the unmerited persecution of Galileo, he says this, quote, Protestants would do better never to mention Galileo in order that we may not in our turn be forced to inquire into their own excesses of religious hatred. In other words, don't throw Galileo up in our face, because the same might happen to you, you Protestants, you heretics. It says, this is such an exhibition of cool audacity as we seldom meet with. Here is a foreign priest, a Jesuit priest, educated out of this country, has no filial love at all for this country. He's, he's in this country, and he's sheltered by our laws, and he clenches his fists and shakes it in our faces, daring, us to, t daring to tell us that we would do better to leave the car of the papacy and the Jesuit and his Jesuit conductors, his rowers, roll unresistingly over us. For if we do not, we shall be punished after the manner of Galileo for our excesses of religious hatred. What religious hatred is he talking about? Our rejection of the papacy is an expression of religious hatred. And that's how they're going to justify the killing, the wholesale, coast-to-coast, -coast, border to border killing of Protestants as haters because they reject the vicar of Jesus Christ on this earth. Don't talk about Galileo because you're next. Because you hate Christ. Because you hate the Pope. That's what's coming. Inquisition. 
That's why this program is called Inquisition Update. And we'll continue tomorrow on Inquisition Update.